Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Guess what? We're going to redo the rapture theory. That is to say the soundtrack. They seem to wear out. And then it's good to talk about it again afresh and, and uh, see if we can't dig a little deeper and understand with clarity what it is our Father would have us know. Is, is the rapture, which the Word actually is not in the Word of God. I know there's a catching away, it's not rapture. That's, the Word isn't there. But there are places that if, um, if you weren't careful, you could think it was there, and we'll cover those places. But the important thing is this, to know what our Father has to say about it. His Word, not what this man, some book, or anyone else might say, but what does the Word of God have to say about it? Now, in the so-called rapture, there's first, let's answer one question. Are we going to gather back to Christ? Absolutely. Well, in what order? Well, exactly as it's written. There's no, I mean, there's no question with anybody that we will gather back with Him, but the question is where? How does it come to pass? And so forth. And to understand, we're going to take Paul's teachings on it first and declare first, we know at the seventh trump a certain thing happens. Is that the gathering back? Well, first, you must know before you can understand the rapture theory that we have two bodies. And if you don't understand that, you're not ready to be taught the really deep study concerning, that is to say, to go into the scriptures concerning the rapture so-called theory. Now, with that, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And actually, Paul tells us about the seventh trump here and the change of bodies and so forth. Uh, with that, he teaches very adequately, fantastic. He was a great teacher uh, as to how many bodies we have, what they basically, how they are formed, and so forth. So let's just get right into it. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's begin, if we may, with verse 34. And we have a flesh body that we know about. We can see that. But we also have another body. It's called a spiritual body. Verse 34, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, and it reads, Awake to righteousness. And that means awake or wake up or get some common sense about what's right. And sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak to your shame. And it is a shame to you if you're biblically illiterate. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. Um, it's to your shame, but then you can change that. You can stop it by simply studying His Word. You don't have to become a religious fanatic, but at least familiarize yourself with the plan of your Father. Verse 35, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? Question, do you know? Well, let's, let's learn. And with what body do they come? In other words, what manner of body do they come in the resurrection with? It's important. Good question. He's going to answer it. Verse 36, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, that is to say made alive, except it die. Now, in other words, if you, he's, going, he's using the analogy of a little seed of grain uh, and when you plant that little seed of grain, the actual seed that you plant, it actually dies and becomes the nutrient for the small embryo inside that grows into a new beautiful plant. 
And he would like for you to grab that analogy. And some might say, well, Paul called him fool. Now, you must learn that the manuscripts, the word fool, is, as it is used here, is not morose. As Christ said, call no man fool. The word is, he said, call no man morose in the Greek, which means a person that is absolutely void of any desire to ever even believe on our Father or anything else. All right, so uh, some people, because they read English, they think they are deep Bible scholars, and sorry, that doesn't fly. Uh, so Paul said, and I don't want to digress here, I, but um, sometimes we just have to explain these sort of things. Uh, quickened, of course, meaning to make alive, and that's the whole point, is to bring people into eternal life. Verse 37, and that which thou sowest, that seed you put in the soil, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. In other words, you just sow the naked grain there. It may change, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. In other words, whatever that seed is, kind after kind, that seed um, is going to change in that dry, bear seed is going to become a beautiful plant, a producing plant. And that one seed, let's, let's use corn, may produce three years of corn with many rows of uh, numerous seeds. Uh, but first, that beautiful plant. So, so it is with the flesh body is what he's implying. When this old flesh body dies, and it's got to die before you can put on the spiritual body, um, and to everything to its time and place, we have duties here in the flesh that we must accomplish doing our Father's work. But before you can put on that spiritual body, then the, the old body, the flesh, must return to the dust from whence it came. Now, let's continue on, verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. When God accomplished the creation, yes, man has seed, animals have seed, and those seed are as God intended. He doesn't like people uh, bringing forth hybrids um, in plant life or anything else. He, he, uh, he created the seed, every body from that seed, as it hath pleased him, the way he wanted it. Verse 39, all flesh, I want you to think now, all flesh, we're not talking about anything spiritual here, all flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beast. Another, uh, another of fishes, and another of birds. Uh, and you have all these various fleshes, everything in its own order, kind after kind, as God intended. Verse 40, listen carefully. There are also celestial, that's to say heavenly, bodies. I want to read that one more time. There are also heavenly celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, that means earthly, made of earth. How many does that? Can you count? All right, and I'm not talking down to you, but the glory of the celestial, the heavenly, is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And so it is, we have our earthly bodies, but we also have a heavenly body, a spiritual body. And, um, which is the best? Well, it would appear in as much as the longevity of the spiritual, that the spiritual would naturally be much better because the flesh is perishable. It grows old, it it's, uh, can become diseased, things can happen to it, it can be injured. Can this happen to the spiritual body? The answer is no, it cannot. Um, and uh, so, Needless to say, we all, the point being, and we, we don't want to pull away from that, and we're talking about the subject here is bodies, okay? Not soul, bodies. We have a spiritual body, we have a flesh body. That's what he has said. Verse 41, 
There is one glory or splendor of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. And many might say, well, what does that mean? Well, in a sense, if you were to go to the 12th chapter of Revelation, you will find that the old dragon drew a third of the stars of heaven by his tail, which is the stars of heaven are called children. And though there are billions of them, you will never find one person that's the same as another. They're all different. And God knows all of his children. That's just, he's supernatural and that's just nature. You know your children. The shepherd knows his sheep, in other words. I don't care how many they are. And all bodies, whether it be celestial or terrestrial, they're all different in both uh, uh, bodies, 42. So also is the resurrection, I hear where the question is being answered, so also is the resurrection of the dead. That's to say, those that are dead in the flesh and spirit also. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Now here you have an absolute, and remember the subject is the body, and you have an absolute, and I'm going to ask that, uh, if we may, that we pull up the word corruption as it is used in the manuscripts. And we will see there that um, thora, and uh, it comes from the prime root of 5351, decay, ruin, um, uh, spontaneous or inflicted literally or figuratively, and then as it is used to, in the companion of the um, uh, King James Bible. In other words, cor the corruptible dies. That's what it means. It means to perish. And we live in bodies that must perish. Now, it said there that the, uh, in that uh, 42nd verse, it said that it, it, it uh, was sown in the ground, or whatever the case, corrupt corruption, but it's raised in corruption. What is this Greek word? Let's call it up. It's aftharsia, aftharsia. It comes from 862, incorruptibility in the genitive case, unending existence. In other words, it will last for the eternity. And we're talking, remember, this is body, not soul. You, I, I must uh, keep you, um, I must urge you that you keep up with the subject. The subject is body. Do we have two bodies? The answer is yes. We have one body that is corruptible. It's going to die. It's going to return to dirt. For that's exactly what it is. In as much as God made man flesh also, Genesis 6 verse 3, that the mother in her intake of organic matter, that is to say matter through vegetation in one form or the other, many times carnivore inserted, be that as it may, but... Um, we intake those um, organic minerals, uh, uh, nutrients, and so forth, and it forms our body, but they're from the dirt, all right? That's why it must die. It's not, um, it's not eternal. Now, your spiritual body, when it is raised, again, we're talking about bodies, not souls. You know, your soul is um, your intellect, so to speak, or that being the spirit, but it's got to have a house to live in. So it has two. The flesh, which was God's decree that we should all be born a woman, that we would pass through this earth age, and uh, also that we would put on this terrestrial body at the instant death of the flesh takes place, and then you're in a body that is that is, we can say, deathlessness. It doesn't die. Now God, after judgment, can cause it to perish, but of its own, it won't wither, wither. Had we gone to the prime root of that word, 
uh, not capable of withering or being diseased or growing old. It um, is the spiritual body that God gave us, the incorruptible body that you will dwell in for the eternity. And again, the subject being bodies, Paul does an excellent job in bringing forth the point we have two bodies. How is it raised? He has answered the question, it is sown as a seed. In other words, the flesh returns to the dust from whence it came. Uh, documentation, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, 6 and 7. But it is raised at the instant of death, as it is written in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, to be absent from this flesh is to be present with the Lord. Uh, you immediately, instantly put on this um, uh, incorruptible body uh, and return to the Father who gave uh, the soul to enter into, and spiritual body to enter into this flesh body. I do not find that confusing at all, and I hope that you do not. And it's important that you remember the difference between corruption and incorruptible. Incorruptible. And hopefully it will give you a little courage to look forward to that day and that uh, you um, occupy the incorruptible body, but also that you look forward to seeing that you overcome whereby God does not destroy the corruptible body, incorruptible body rather, in the lake of fire at the end of judgment, that's to say at the end of the millennium. Many people get all nervous if you say everyone. Well, we'll carry that uh, farther. Verse 43, let's go on with it. Bearing in mind two bodies, bodies being the subject, it is sown in dishonor. Flesh is sin. It's sinful. It really cries at you for this, that, or the other. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. And so it is. Now, these things are essential to understanding the so-called rapture doctrine. You've got to have a little knowledge concerning how a body is resurrected. That's what it's about, being resurrected and joining the Father. All right? Um, so uh, now it's, it's, um, it's planted or you're born weak, uh, you are uh, subject to the calls of the flesh, but it is resurrected, raised very strong, willpower, so forth. 44, it is sown a natural body. This one, all right? Flesh. It is raised a spiritual body. And it's essential that you, there's the diverse of the two bodies. Don't natural, spiritual, natural, spiritual. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Again, can you count? It's, it's all brought forth for you right there. You got a natural body and when you put that away, ere the old silver cord should part as it's written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, then the spiritual body slips away. Does it dwell within this man? I feel it does. We were created in our own image. God said, let us make man in our image. That's why Christ looked like the Father. And that's why other people look as they did, as the, the spiritual body. No big deal in that, all right? It was a testing ground when one-third of God's children failed. He didn't want to kill the children, but to give a testing ground where they will either love him or Satan. Now continuing, verse 45. And so it is written, and so it is. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. That living soul was placed within him. The last Adam, that being Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Uh, quickening, again, means life giver. By accepting on the cross what he did, he gives us life for repentance. Verse 46, how be it? 
that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual. Why does God do it this way? That's a good question. Many people would say, well, why would he want to put us in these old flesh, perishable bodies? Well, for the wise student of God's word, you know that we were in spiritual bodies in the first earth age. I probably lose a few there, be that as it may. Get the blinders off. Verse 47. The first man, the first Adam, that's old Adam and Eve, all right, is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven, Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 48, And as is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. In other words, if you're in a heavenly body, yes, it's heavenly. If you're in the earth body, it's earthy. It's going to stay earthy. It's going to um, talk to you. It's going to try to get you to, to weaken in many things uh, because it likes to look out for itself. Why? Well, it's, a, it's organic matter. And that's just the beast of it, if you will. No, I didn't call people beast, but I, uh, that's the way of the, the being. Verse 49, and as we have borne the image of the earthly, I mean, you can see them, they're walking all over the earth, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And you're going to. And this bothers some Christians. They say, well, I don't want any sinner up there bearing the heavenly. Don't worry, they won't bear it long. They still have a heavenly body or an incorruptible body. And when the flesh dies, they automatically put it on. And it's like dressing up for the judgment, if you want to put it that way. And many people say, well, I thought they went straight to hell. There is nowhere is that written. The parable, you must not misunderstand in Luke 16 of Lazarus and the rich man. Christ was painting you a picture of the order of things in God's presence. That they were all with him, but some were on the other side of a gulf they could not cross. Were they in heavenly bodies? Of course they were. Because many of them have been there for almost 6,000 years now. And they're in an incorruptible body, which is to say one that won't die. And that's also why it's written in the great book of Matthew, Fear not those that can kill the flesh body, but rather fear your Father in heaven who can cause your spiritual body to perish. And uh, I'm, I quote that in that way. We'll bring mortal into it. We haven't covered it yet, but I want you to understand mortal in its correctness in a moment. The subject is still corruption and incorruption, addressing bodies. The image means, what does the word image mean? It looks like. They may look the same, but one's earth and the other is heavenly, spiritual, all right? But they still look the same. Now, Verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot, I want to repeat that, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Everything in its order and place. In other words, there is no way one can walk in heaven in a flesh body. We have had one or two transfigurations, but that's a change also, all right? But um, many actually want to go out here and raise the old flesh body right out of the ground and use it all over again, and they show their ignorance as far as God's Word is concerned, because that is not written, and we'll document that in this uh, set of lectures on rapture theory. It's important now that we look back upon this because he's about to show us a mystery. And I want you to have all this locked in and certainly not suffer at any digression on my part and realize we have two bodies. We have one that is natural and 
that walks upon the earth that were, was birthed by our mother, God placed the soul that's brought into it, into the flesh body, the spiritual body, the soul, the existence, self, into the flesh to live its life in this earth stage, I will call it, and then to be planted and to grow forth in the incorruptible body. And there is no way you can return to God until you have put on that incorruptible body at the time that, um, that sickness, whatever, might require. Again, we have a destiny and a purpose and we live our lives in happiness, if you choose, by having Christ in us. 51. Behold, you look here. That's what he's saying. I show you a mystery. I'm going to let you in on something that you really need to know. We shall not all sleep. That means we're not all going to die. But we shall all, that's A-L-L, -L, all be changed. Now some people would say, well now he's just talking to the Christians here. The sinner doesn't change. I'm sorry. The sinner does change. Because there is no way the sinner in flesh can walk before our Almighty God and be judged. All are changed because the prior verse stipulated. They cannot inherit nor go in before God in the flesh. Doesn't happen. But we shall all be changed. And it's going to happen what? Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, zap, when? He's going to tell you when. At the last trump. Now in the Greek, this is the farthest trump out, the, the ultimate, the last. Don't let some fluff ball tell you any different. Check it out yourself in your Strong's Concordance. For the trumpet, that's the seventh, this is the time now, shall sound, not maybe, it will sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. This is to say those that are spiritually dead even will be raised also. And we shall be changed. Every living being won't die, but they're going to be changed. For what? For judgment. For the millennium and then judgment, I should say. Verse 53. Now, now this is very, very important. Listen carefully. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Now, I've given you the Greek on this. This natural body must put on the body that's never going to die. Okay, that's what corruptible, going to die, incorruption, not going to die never die unless God so gives it the walk. And this mortal, whoa, we have a new subject introduced here in the Greek. Not body here. Mortal must put on immortality. Now what are we talking about? Mortal is always referred to or most often referred to as soul. And that's what we're talking about, the soul that God placed in the flesh body. Not the body, but the soul that was placed in it. In other words, what your soul deserves, it's going to get. It has the incorruptible body, but if the soul does not accept Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, if the soul does not please God by loving Him, then um, the soul is in a state called mortal. If we may, let's have the Greek word mortal. It's theitos, theitos, all right? And it comes from the prime 2348, liable to die. If you've studied with me very long, you've heard me say that. The word mortal means liable to die. No guarantee. You know why? You've got to earn it. Or we could even translate it. Not tran we couldn't translate it, but we can basically give the meaning in a figure of speech. Instead of liable to die, liable to go to hell. 
because that's what will bring about the death. The soul, when it is still mortal, is dead. That's why it is written in Revelation, the dead must remain dead until the end of the thousand years. Why? Satan's got to be released before they can be tested and God doesn't want anything that isn't tested and overcome Satan. So we see here then that also as far as the soul is concerned, we have the two bodies. We know the flesh body's got to put off and put on the death, uh, the, the body that won't die, spiritual body. But we've all got, so got a soul mortal that's liable to die. Now let, let's pull up the word immortality here. It must put on what? Athanasia. And uh, it comes from a compound of uh, one is a negative uh, particle and uh, the prime 2288, but it's deathlessness, deathlessness. Now to overcome totally and completely, you must put on incorruption, that is to say change the natural body into a body that is um, eternal, but at the same time, to totally overcome, you must put on, put off the mortal, and by accepting and repenting, that happens, you put on immortality, athanasia, which is deathlessness, of the soul and body, then you're an overcomer. Though that's how the resurrection takes place. People are resurrected in both states. By that I mean, uh, Absolutely, they're going to put on the spiritual body, but many of them will still have a mortal soul, meaning liable to die at judgment. And many will have immortality. That is the description of the soul that will live forever. The millennium is an interesting time. So we see the new subject introduced that will give you probably one of the best teachings, this is to say by Paul, to help you understand by his illustration of a grain seed and the various workings of the Greek language when you hold to the subject uh, that is given. Now, I want to go through it one more time. We're all planted in a mortal, uh, that is to say, a corruptible body. That's natural. But we're all changed to a spiritual body that is heavenly. And then after that, that is, that is just God's word. That's going to happen regardless. But the most important thing is that this mortal put on immortality. Now, let's, uh, let's finish by covering the next two verses, verse 54. So when this corruptible, this flesh body, shall have put on incorruption, that is to say has put on the spiritual body, and this mortal, that's to say my soul liable to die, shall have put on athanasia, which is to say deathlessness, eternal life, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in Victory, 55, O oh, death, where is thy sting? It has none, if you have put on immortality. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? It has no victory, for the grave only receives the corruptible, and it returns to the dirt from which it came, the dirt that the grave is. It is um, a wonderful thing to understand the two bodies and the two conditions as well of the soul. We could oversimplify it simply by saying overcomers and those that want. But Paul has given an excellent lesson and you will need that foundation as we go on into what about the rapture theory? Okay? Don't miss one lecture concerning this. Why? because it inoculates you against deception. Nobody wants to be deceived. How do we avoid it? By learning from our Father's Word how it will be. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?
free introductory package. Say this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, if we may, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it, won't you? Now, never ask a question about a specific denomination, individual, or organization. Let's teach God's Word in a positive sense. We can no longer answer all questions because of the millions of homes we go into, but take a handful, who knows? Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure to hear from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Got a prayer request? He's your father. Father, around the globe, we can, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, heal in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Okay, let's see what's on people's minds. We got Mickey from Florida. Please clarify for me the difference in the remnant, the elect, and the first fruits. Okay, that's real simple. The remnant are those that have already passed on to the Father or will before the false Messiah appears. That is to say, and Romans chapter 11 will clarify this, even the word remnant. There has always been a remnant that has known the truth that passes it on from generation to generation concerning the correct chronological order of events in God's plan. Now, the elect are those that earn the right, the equivalent of the remnant, but that are living when the false Messiah sets foot on earth. And they are all through Christ first fruits, with Christ being the chief first fruit. Do you know what the inheritance of a first fruit is? Double portion. Okay, WB from South Carolina. What is your opinion on using the almanac as far as planning by the signs? Well, it's, it's, um, it's permissible. Don't make a religion out of it, but um, I like to just use common sense. Uh, if you've ever been around the ocean, it's not unusual for the moon to raise the ocean. Think of the weight, think of the power, five feet. It's called tide. The, I mean, the moon makes a difference in water levels. So naturally, if you're planting root crops or anything else, it's just like when there is a full moon, it raises the water level in the brain and a lot of cuckoos come out at night and, and go cockle-doodle-doo. You know, I mean, any, any nurse, doctor, uh, paramedic, or preacher will tell you that, you know. Naturally, it makes a difference. I probably shouldn't have said that, but back to the planting of the crops, it does make a difference, okay? And there's nothing satanic or anything about that. It's God's nature. Carol from Minnesota. I try to plant seeds every day, but sometimes I fear I'll say too much. My question, please give some more specific um, uh, guidance to follow so I don't do any harm. Um, well, you, you, my dear, you're not going to do any harm. If God has sealed the ears, there's nothing we can do to, to remove the plugs, all right, if he wants them there. When, just, I always like to say and use analogies that are very simple is we're supposed to be fishers of men. How do you fish? You don't throw the anchor at them. You simply put out a little bait 
and you leave it there and you wiggle that bait gently but firmly, and actually this is according to what you're fishing for, and whoom, if they take that bait, reel them in. If they don't, let them go. But they've got to take the little seed first because only God can make the seed grow. Just be gentle in it. Um, we gotta, we've, got to, the, we've got the millennium to plant seeds all the way through. So we're just getting started. Don't be impatient and don't worry. But use common sense and don't dump the whole load on them, okay? Uh, Char Charla, Charla from California. In Matthew, it says your eye causes you to commit adultery, gouge it out, and if your hand does, cut it off. Is this really true? No, 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 no. We, the churches together, make up the full body of Christ. Uh, I like to say groups rather than churches. And if some group over here, in other words, one part of that uh, body is the hand and the other is the mouth and some the feet and it makes up a many-membered body. And what it means is that if some group over here begins teaching something that's heresy, you cut yourself off from that part of the group because if they're going to fall, don't let them make the whole body fall. Sever yourself from meeting with that group. Uh, because they're teaching falsehoods, okay? That's what it means. Sherry from Texas. I just heard you say that if you're not a Christian, it's because you're not good enough and, and should go to church every, and she's got Sunday, and I should believe in your church or I won't go to heaven. I didn't say that. Where are you getting that from? I, I, would, I would never say something like this. I, I can't go to church on Sunday because I work and I don't believe you're right. Well, if I had really said that, I wouldn't believe I was right either, my dear. But, uh, you know, before you accuse somebody, you really need to understand what they said. I, I would not say something like this, all right? Um, if God can't use you, then if you don't, it is true that if you don't want to study God's Word, He really can't use you because you don't know what to do. How could you, how could you um, accomplish something for God if you didn't know what His plan was, all right? Well, the Holy Spirit will guide me. Yes, after you do your homework, all right? Doug from Arkansas, do you know where you obtain a copy of the 1611 King James Bible? If you're talking about the original, you, you acquire it right here. I'm happy to say that Shepherd's Chapel through Nelson caused the original 16 level to be reprinted. They were going to drop it. And I thought it was a shame. And I had to order 5,000 of them to get them to reprint, which they have. We have them here. And actually, um, they're not a good study Bible. Uh, I, I'm talking about the, exactly as it was in the old original 1611. The reason I like it is there is a letter in it that was written by the translators to the reader. That's you. And every reader of the King James should read that letter because there are cautions in it that the translators themselves want to warn you about or have you participate in. Right here, you can have one. You can not have one. I think they are, I don't know what they are. You'll have to, have to find out. Lewis from Pennsylvania. I have two questions. What does the scripture mean by heaven and earth will pass away? I thought heaven lasted forever. And what will service be like in heaven? What will we be doing? The Shepherd's Chapel is a great program. Well, the, no, you, you misunderstand. You really do. Heaven, this heaven age will pass away. This earth age will pass away. But this erets, if I may speak in Hebrew for a moment, the terra firma, uh, okay, um, it's forever. It's been here for millions and millions of years. It's going to be here for the eternity. God loves it. He's coming back here, and this is where the kingdom will be established. Just the age passes away in dispensation of time. Regina from Ohio. 
My question is, I asked my pastor, why doesn't he teach the Antichrist in our church or even the millennium? And his answer was that he felt it was really over our heads. What do you think about that question? Thank you and God bless. Well, unfortunately, my dear, that's the frame of mind that many pastors are in. And I, it's a sin. It really is. The reason people, the reason it would be over their heads is that he's never taught them how to understand. And that's, after all, a pastor, uh, a pastor, the very name itself, it comes from our word pasture, that cattle graze in. He's over the grazing, the fodder that we feed the cattle, and, and now let that be the analogy of what the word pastor means. The only reason it would be over their heads, he hadn't fed them. It's his fault. Uh, it's sad. It really is, but it's very true. And I'm sorry, but many seminaries teach them to never teach concerning anything that could be the least bit controversial. It'll drive people away. That's really, they are so wrong in that because we can hardly get people in. I mean, we have to continue building and expanding to get people in. And all we teach is more in-depth word from our Father. If they would teach the word, they wouldn't have empty houses. And, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying if the shoe fits, you know, there are pastors that are good and there's pastors that have some pretty skimpy grass. Kennedy from Florida. Why, when the Bible says Holy Ghost, you use Holy Spirit instead? Well, um, because the manuscripts say spirit. God is not a spook, okay? So the word ghost does not belong there. Man placed it there, and this is in part why you should read the letter written to the reader in the King James 1611. Um, I usually read it spirit instead of ghost because it really bothers me to use the word ghost when I know what the manuscripts say and I know God's not a spook, all right? And I think it puts a who uh, type uh, mystic atmosphere to the very Holy Spirit of my father when they call him a spook and that's what a ghost is. As a linguist, I, f I have trouble with it, all right? I don't like it. But, but, hey, we can all be friends and get along. If you want to say Holy Ghost, go ahead. It's all right. Uh, Angela from Pennsylvania. Did Jesus feel responsible for the sins of the whole world since he was the first Adam? Well, there he was not the first Adam. Adam, the first man created in the flesh by God was the first Adam. He was the second, which is the spiritual, the higher. The first man, Adam, that was supposed to be the father of the people, he fell. He listened to the serpent. The second man, Adam, was taken into the wilderness and the serpent talked to him and well, guess what? He told him to hang it. He overcame. Penny from Florida. I have a question that is very important to me. In Malachi, it says that we should bring our tithes into the um, st storehouse, uh, that um, there will be meat in the Lord's house. However, most other uh, pastors um, say that we should tithe to the church that teaches us. You teach me, and I only know of one church that has meat in its storehouse. I'm confused. Well, hon, don't you understand analogies, idioms, uh, metaphors, and figures of speech? That's what this is. Have you never read Amos chapter 8, where it stipulates that the famine in the end times is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God? that we are to be fed meat. Paul would say in Hebrews chapter 5 and 6, they have need, instead of for meat, for milk again, speaking of the word. 
deep study is the meat of God's Word, and that does put God's blessings in the storehouse. Uh, therefore, quite simply, another figure of speech, and I hope that you can follow me now that you're on that level of thinking, you tithe where you're fed. Because if nobody tithes where they're fed, that feeding won't take place very long because um, God will pull it away from them, okay? Mike from Minnesota. How do I rebuke bad thoughts as I can't um, readily tell if it's demonic or my own laziness? I've been reading the Bible daily. Well, um, everybody has a different appetite for understanding. Some people, if you've, uh, usually I will never teach a class over about 50 minutes. Because if you have really done your homework and if you are really feeding them, at the end of 50 minutes, they need a break because they're not going to be able to absorb anymore. So uh, you should go accordingly. Some people can study for hours and their appetite is whetted only. And some people can study 30 minutes and that's it. They can't retain anymore. So you should do as God would lead. Urban from Ohio, how does God determine each individual with so many people of the same name? How does he determine who's who? Oh, he knows the difference. And he has a name for all of us. He knows our families, our tribes, our lineage. Uh, God's never lost anybody. And uh, does that mean some will not be judged to hell? They sure will be. One already has, along with his lieutenants, and that's Satan, whom God thought quite highly of at one time because it's obvious by his position given in Ezekiel 28. Uh, Diana from Texas. What does it mean when God tells Satan, touch not my anointed ones? Well, exactly that. Um, Satan is not allowed. You'll find probably a better, uh, you'll probably better understand in Revelation chapter 9, along about verse 4, where God said, hey, you can go down there and touch all of them you want to. Just don't kill any of them. But don't touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead, which means that you have the working plan of God in your, in your mind, your brain, and he can't deceive you anyway. That in large part. Uh, Rodney from Illinois. I know if you're a Christian and you die, and you're right with God, you'll eventually go to heaven. But I also know that somewhere in the Bible it says that you can't go to heaven until Judgment Day. Where are these people now, and isn't this true? Well, I think today's lecture probably answered that for you. They're with him. The analogy in Luke 16 of, um, of heaven, the gulf, and hell, there's not an actual fire there. That's embarrassment and so forth, all right? Uh, Gloria from Alabama, I heard you say that Satan was in heaven. How can this be true if Michael cast him out already? He hasn't. Christ told him to get back there, get behind me. Revelation 12, uh, 7 has not come to pass yet, but my dear, it's going to, as it's written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This confuses me because I thought heaven was a holy city with nothing evil um, ever connected. Well, it's there, but it has no influence. Don't let that bother you. Michael's keeping a close watch on him, but his evil spirits must roam this earth to deceive the weak. And the weak are those that are not strong by being in God's word. My, Michelle from Arkansas. When Jesus comes for his second coming, will sinners or deceivers have a chance to be saved? If they never had a chance, there's no such thing as a second chance. But with what a lot of people are being taught, they haven't got a chance to start out with as far as deception is concerned. Chris from Florida. Do babies that die before they are born go to heaven instantly? Innocent. I think some people are too good for this world and uh, we're too good in the first earth age to even live in this flesh, but it cannot be said to God that he did not send them through it. Um, Aldez from Florida. 
Please explain 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. It says the wicked one will be revealed after he is taken out of the way. Who is the he? In the seventh verse, the verb is transitive, and you have to revert back to the fourth and fifth verse to understand who the he is. It's Satan. The other he is Michael that boots him out, period. Okay? 12-7 to document that. Again, transitive verb, that is to say he and he, you go back you transfer the action back to who it was the subject and then an object and you have Satan in verse 4 uh, and 5. When someone dies with sin, do they go straight to hell? Also, can a person that was once a bad person become a preacher or a teacher of the Lord, of the Word? Well, if they're converted, of course, Paul was a pretty good example of that. He harassed the church considerably and he wrote most of the New Testament. It's got to be genuine, though. Did the six-day creation have souls? Carol from Arkansas. Of course they did. All of God's children have souls. Okay, don't ever listen to anybody that would say there are a people without souls. Um, God loves his people the way he created them, and naturally he created all of them for his pleasure. Betty from Georgia, is it okay to pray about the same subject matter more than once. I'm not showing a lack of faith, am I? Question. Someone told me it was a lack of faith to pray about something more than once. Well, that's not true. The Bible says do not re pray, pray repetition. That means chant, to get chanting into your religion. Don't do that in praying to God. But you can pray for it every day if you want to, and that's not a chant. Hey, I'm out, I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal because Real special reason, you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. Hey, that makes you special to me. So many people just don't care. But do you know what's most important? It makes you special to our Heavenly Father. Thus, He blesses you for it. It really causes Him to love you. Remember this more than anything. Stay in His Word. Every day in His Word's a good day. Do you know why? Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. You have been viewing the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you are interested in obtaining more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer includes the Mark of the Beast audio tape, a newsletter with a written Bible study, a complete audio tape catalog, and a list of reference materials available through Shepherd's Chapel. You may request our free introductory offer by telephone. Call 1-800-643-4645, 24 hours a day to request the offer. You may also request by writing, Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us and serious Bible students around the world for our next in-depth Bible study, Monday through Friday at the same time. Thank you for watching and God bless you.